it. We've got the like the purpley blue thing going on. Yeah. It's like we planned it. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I I guess uh, voice actors of a feather. <laughs> I I guess. Um, Tell me, are you a voice actor? Um, not a professional voice actor, but there are people who whittle away at wood and make wooden sculptures, and there are those who do it by trade. So, I'd say, uh, it's a little bit of date for me. <laughs> beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> This this is amazing. I mean, I'm sorry. I get this starstruck every time I interview one of my voiceover heroes. And most recently, I interviewed Pat Fraley from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, my first um, interview ever was the day of Biden's inauguration, Michael Bell. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Transformers fan, but also... I've seen all the Sailor Moon episodes, and in the first season, you were actually the second to take the mic as Serena Sakino for Deke, right? Yep. There was Tracy Moore, who recorded mm -hmm. the first, I think, six episodes, and then my understanding was that she had some creative differences with the producers and left the series. But here's a little piece of trivia, if you want to know. Tracy I and I... Tracy and I used to um, act in community theater together in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, when we were teenagers. Oh, wow. Yeah. I said, let her go. And who are you? Uh, uh, well, my name's... I am Sailor Moon, the champion of justice. And I say on behalf of the moon, I shall right wrong and triumph over evil. And that means you. All I ever you. wanted was to be a normal teenager because of you, that's all over. And you're gonna pay for that, pal. You're going to the compost heap. Vampire. In the name of the moon, I will punish you. I'm Sailor Moon. I will triumph over evil. That's you, Green Waste. The only thing you're gonna be hitting is rock bottom, you slimy heart-snatching creepstress. I am Sailor Moon, the champion of justice! So look out, you heart snatcher! I will not let you take this drummer's heart, so just beat it! So it's kind of an interesting thread of connection that, that we would end up in Toronto playing the same role. So I kind of like that. I like that connection. You're She's Canadian? A very talented actor. I am Canadian. I'm actually, actually, I have dual citizenship, but I was born in Canada and raised in Canada. I've lived mm -hmm. in the States a, a few times. Pardon me? Well, don't worry. I'm nothing like Barney Stinson. Attention, Canada. I am Barney from America. <laughs> And I'm here to tell you how much I love your country, home to Terry Hawks, Richard Newman, Lee Takar, and so many others. I have nothing but the utmost respect for Canada, and even I know that Dudley Do Right is just stereotypes. Even though Bill Scott and Paul Fries and June Foray gave us all light hearts for over those segments. Maple syrup and the second Sailor Moon, there's a lot to be thankful for to Canada. There are so many talented people in Canada in all fields, of course. A lot of Canadians try their mettle in the States. They might move to New York or L.A. and many come back and many, many stay in the States and they've made really great careers for themselves. But uh, there's some great opportunities in Canada for actors, writers, directors. So it ends up being an amazing training ground, actually not just for people in front of the camera, but behind the scenes, the Canadian crews are known to be some of the best in the world, which is why one of the reasons why so many of the American productions are shot in Canada and uh, and co-productions with other countries. So, yeah, it's a very fertile ground for artists of all of all stripes, for sure.
How many mm, times when you're interviewed are you ever asked about your general hospital days? Weirdly, once recently. And <laughs> until then, it's been a very long time. Before then, it was a very long time. So, yeah, I'm so, you did your research because that's before your time. That was a while ago. <laughs> I, I did have um, the uh, General Hospital scrapbook. I first started reading it when I got hooked on General Hospital when my brother was in the hospital. And I saw I saw your name in the index. I looked up Wendy Masters, and I went to 1990. And it, my understanding is your character was in league with a ne'er-do-well named Decker Moss, and but you were in love with Ned Ashton Quartermain. Who's now played by Wally Kurth. Yes, you're right. Um, it was it was one of those joyful jobs. I've got to say, I'd been living in New York and working in theater in New York, and I'd been in this play, a Canadian play actually called Tamara, and um, by John Krizank, and it was environmental theater. You follow the actors from room to room, like upstairs, downstairs, kind of a theme in Italy in the 1920s. Anyway, I played a ballerina upstairs sometimes, and I played a, a maid downstairs other times. It was a really juicy show, and it was a big hit in New York. And shortly after I finished my job there, I had decided to move to Los Angeles because I was interested in doing more television and film work. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know anybody in L.A. I flew to L.A., I and I started seeing theater right away. I thought, this is a good way to get to know the L.A. community. So I went to the theater. And I happened to sit beside a man named Mark Teschner. And Mark Teschner was and is the casting director for General Hospital. And Mark had just moved from New York uh, not too long before that and recognized me from my work in Tamara and maybe a couple of other plays in New York. And we had a nice chat and it was so nice to see a friendly face. And he's a, he's a really nice guy, a really lovely human being. And after the play, he said, well, Terry, I'm auditioning for this role in General Hospital, Wendy Masters. And I kind of think you might be right for this role. Will you come on in? And I said, of course, I'd love to. So I showed up and I auditioned for him. And then he took me to the executive producer, Joe Hardy, to audition. And they offered me the role. And it was such a gift, Jeffrey, because I didn't have mm -hmm. an agent in LA yet. Uh, and an agent is generally how you get auditions. But because I had worked in New York and because he had seen me and because I showed up at the theater, which was a way to sort of get to know the industry in L.A., all of those things, you know, putting out those feelers and doing the footwork and uh, showing up, all of those things contributed to that moment, to Mark thinking maybe there was a match, to them offering me the job. And then it even got better from there because I was supposed to be doing it for a few weeks and I guess the writers liked what I was doing. They expanded my role. It got even juicier. <laughs> and uh, months and months later, I was the summer murder mystery for General Hospital. So I thought I would be a nice guy and offer you an opportunity to give me your side of the story. What side of what story? Why your name and Gloria Shelby's name was in Wendy Masters' black book. Oh, how should I know? That girl was a bona fide loony. There were large sums of money. If I'm not mistaken, Wendy, Wendy was found dead on a carousel on the pier. Yes, it's very dramatic.
Yeah. Very dramatic. That's that's but, definitely uh, one that people wouldn't forget. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, no. I, I, I'm so amazed that you've seen it and you know it. I was just going to add to that. I had a really big life lesson that I would love to share. Um, I kind of, I didn't watch soap operas that much. And I don't know if you know this, but in New York, there's kind of, there can be this, um, a bit of an elitist attitude, like New York theater is sort of, you know, the best of the best. and The best of the best of the best, sir. It is. It's amazing. The, the actors who have come out of the theater world in New York. But I didn't have the same sort of maybe respect for soap opera acting. I, it mm -hmm. seemed like it would be fairly simple. Well, I've got to tell you, it is one of the hardest acting jobs I've ever done. And I would say this is probably true for most soap opera actors because it's done so quickly. They shoot a new show every day, like an hour a day. That's huge. That's so fast. Other television shows don't shoot that quickly or films for sure. I saw so much of myself in him, the intuition, the rough edged street smarts, the thirst for adventure. Well, that sounds like a Spencer to me. It sounds like a Scorpio. He's very much a father's son. I think you'd say anything right now to get me off this bloody bridge. I am not the one saying this. You don't have to believe me. I got it from the only person who knows the truth. Ethan's mother. We're now considering Holly to be a credible source on a situational basis. Come on, she's To be able to learn a full script and do it day after day and sometimes shoot more than one show a day and sometimes shoot all the scenes in this hospital room for the next five episodes. So you're trying to remember this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, what happened on those days, the surrounding circumstances and remember your lines and show up for the right spots that you have to be in front of the camera and connect to your fellow actors and to do your work that you're taught to do as an actor, your your character development, create your objectives, understand, you know, what you're trying to do in each scene. It's a lot of work. And it was fantastic. It was great training for me for television acting. And I have to say, going back to this lesson that I learned was, number one, never underestimate how difficult any job is, no matter what the field, no matter what anybody does, you never know until you try Absolutely. it. And number two, soap opera work as an actor and as a director writer is grueling and demanding and challenging. And I have the greatest respect for the teams that pull together these shows day after day after day, year after year, decade after decade. It's it was an amazing opportunity and I'm forever grateful. And one thing that I've learned um, in my passion for voice acting and the voice actors is soap operas are in hand in glove with voice acting in a sense, because you'll find voice actors in, in soaps that you never realized. Like, for instance, around the time you were on General Hospital, Tristan Rogers, who was Robert Scorpio, the first scene I ever saw you in, in on YouTube, um, he was in an episode of Batman Beyond, Anna, Anna Devane, played by Fiona Hughes, was um, Superman's mother in Superman the Animated Series. You are the sole survivor of Krypton, a planet similar to Earth in many ways. You're smart to come in now. If my critics have their way, splicing might go the way of the dinosaurs. Not that I don't plan to fight them tooth and nail. But, but he's quite right. This is the mantle worn by all the initiated, what you call the wise ones. <laughs> Have pity on an old man's blood pressure. What is it, Jim? We're taking a pounding over this new gang. Their boss puts heists together smooth as a Swiss watchmaker. What have you got for me? Not much. We don't know who the boss is or any of the gang members. But a home video enthusiast taped the gang leaving the scene of their latest crime. Interested? Always. We now return to Voice Overview with Terry Hawks. Bob Hastings, who was Bert Ramsey, was the one who played Commissioner Gordon. <laughs> you not only do your research, but, but you do your, your vocal research as well. Nice imitations there. Very nicely done. Well, I'm I'm very passionate about this because when you don't have people that you can talk to, you can always rely on cartoons that were that were made with heart. And 
one of those that I'll share with you is my favorite, is probably one you grew up with. I already mentioned it partially. Rocky and Bullwinkle. Time again for Bullwinkle's Corner. Hello there. Today's poem is called Taffy. Taffy was a Welshman. Taffy was a thief. You ain't kidding, governor. Taffy came to my house and stole a piece of beef. Hey, that's a whole cow. So I'm petting my part a little. Mm. Yes. I, you know what? I didn't watch a lot of TV when I was a kid, but I do remember that. And it's a really sweet series. You're right. Heart. Heart is such a good word. It has heart. Yeah. Although I will say that it is, it's not innocent by today's standards because there were stereotypes like with any other show around that time. And there wasn't as much inclusion of different races. But right. those are sins that only stay sins if you don't talk about it and acknowledge it. And just and try to keep the spirit of what it was. I would agree with you. And and for sure it, it goes beyond race and culture. And uh, so many of the shows that I've been involved in or that we have seen collectively uh, have, yes, by your vocabulary, committed sins of omission, let's say, by not representing uh, marginalized groups, underrepresented characters, people, stories. And I, I agree with you. It's great to call it out and say that we see what we see and try to do better going forward. Yeah. Um, in The Simpsons, they only just recently started applying that. Um, Hank Azaria and Harry Shearer had to drop their roles that were of color. And Kevin Michael Richardson, a very well-known African-American actor, extremely well-respected in this field. He's the one who plays Dr. Hibbert now, and he's been in practically everything. I, I don't know who the others are, but it, it's about time that The Simpsons did that. Um, but that's that's not the focus of today. You brought it up. Yeah. Of course. I, I don't insult my guests by doing anything subpar and doing puff pieces. Although I, I am in awe that I am talking to Sailor Moon. And I'm happy to talk to you, Jeffrey. Uh, I'm starting to blush like when Serena was always around Tuxedo Mask. <laughs> we all have those moments. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So... Alongside your fellow voice actors from that era, including Susan Roman and Stephanie Morgenstern. Um, Uh-oh, I've got some brain overload going here. Can you help me, Terry? Katie Griffin, Karen Bernstein, Jill Frappier, Ron Rubin, Toby Proctor. <laughs> Pretty great cast, yes. Go Keep going. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that the only other voice actor that, that I remember the name of was the one who took your place in Pioneer. Linda Valentine. Yep. Yeah. The, the squawky Sailor Moon, is, as I like to call that version. But no disrespect to Miss Valentine. If you're a voice actor, you're behind the mic, and you're giving it your all, and that makes you wonderful, and as long as you do it with heart and treat others with respect, then that's all anybody should ever care about, not quibble about, like, who filled in for a voice actor for one episode of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, like Hal Rail, wonderful guy. Um, so, I, You know what, can I, I, just, can I just say something there? So. Absolutely. I, th I think you'll appreciate this. I think one of the hardest jobs with some of the actors you mentioned, you know, who are uh, taking over roles because of an awareness on the part of the creators, or in my case, it was because I, I had a challenging pregnancy and prioritized my pregnancy over this very physical role of Sailor Moon that I loved doing. Mm -hmm. And so one of the one of the most challenging things I think is to take over a role from somebody else and to try, to try to find the essence of that person a little bit, but to also make it your own. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that Linda took over. I would have loved to have continued um, in the role of Sailor Moon. I really missed uh, being able to, to 
to carry that story on further, but I have two amazing kids now, young adults. And, um, and I hope Linda had a great run with it. I think that she did from all accounts. So there's room for more than one interpretation of a character and, uh, and none of us are alike. So accounts. So there's room for more than one interpretation of a character and, uh, and none of us are alike. So uh, I just I just give kudos to anyone who's willing to to try to try to take over a role and make it their own because it's it's got its own set of challenges. Was Uncle Stewart wearing a blue suit, red tie, and tennis shoes? Yeah, when we last saw him. Then I think we found him. Only he looks a little older now. Why? Wow. Food? Yuck! Forget the cat food, Scoob. There's a lot better chow in this kitchen. Mmm. Smells great. It's gumbo. Sure thing, officer. Where are you headed tonight? In the light, there's this green monster, officer. Sneaking around at the old cut mill. <laughs> Shaggy, you're up. Like, is it because they're not the brightest tools in the deck? Check it out, Scoob. The most beautiful words in the world. Oh, you can eat. And just for a little kick, here's some extras for our audience. What kind of performance do you call that? You made me sound like a total space cadet, man. I'm sorry if you're the way I was. Just, I was trying to be real to your character. If you like goof on me in the sequel, I'm coming after you. Question: yeah. Why is the Scooby Gang so much more entertaining and funny and all around better than those lame, stupid, dum dums, the Teen Titans? Because of versatile voice actor Frank Welker. Like, who's Frank Welker? Frank Welker is the voice actor behind all of my favorite cartoon characters. Megatron from Transformers, Slimer from the real Ghostbusters, Fred over there, and even Scooby-Doo! Me? Don't worry, there's no way our voices come from some guy named Frank. Is Frank Welker up there? It didn't actually sting with me as much because I had never seen Sailor Moon until mm, they showed episodes of the third season on Kids WB in 2001. So Linda was actually the first that I ever heard mm, because I, I hadn't watched in Sailor Moon in the 90s. I mean, I didn't have cable, so it was the Disney afternoon for me. Um, and, and when I started watching the other episodes, I mean, I was entranced by the voice cast. I, I loved Stephanie as Sailor Venus. Um, and the only actor who stayed throughout both was Sue Roman as yeah. Sailor Jupiter. Um, Sailor Mars was replaced in mid-season of Sailor Moon R, and then her voice actor was the one who replaced Stephanie Morgenstern. I feel bad that I don't know their names, but I, I didn't want to, you know, do what I usually do and do all the fact searching. I wanted there to be magic in it still and not have my voiceover hero think, this guy is crazy. He knows more about this stuff than me. And... Oh. I would not think that I would think with admiration that you know as much as you do because you do know more about this than me in many ways. So I love that. I, I, I learn from listening. So that's why I started voice overview in the first place. I don't have that many, you know, people who watch it and I don't think my videos have ever been seen more than a few times each, but it's, it's me interacting with my heroes and sharing my love of the voiceover industry. And Ben and Hal, you have a very cool Uncle Jeffrey, and I'm very happy for you that not only has he been proactive and created this, this podcast series so he can connect with people who are like-minded, but he had the presence of mind and the love for you, Ben and Hal, to give you a shout out on his show. And I join him in saying, hey, Ben and Hal, keep fighting the Negaverse. Sailor Moon says. 
when when I interviewed um, Richard Newman, who was in, in, uh, in Beast Wars and a whole bunch of others, he and Lee, they talked about the dubbing process. And voice actors who do stuff domestically, they have the luxury of just having a storyboard and a script that they can work off of and add themselves in without any walls. Oh, don't worry, Love a Lot. I'm not here to practice. I thought maybe you could help me find a place to practice where I won't bother my friends. Oh, I'd love to help. Perfect. Rainshine Meadows. It's the merriest place in Carolot. It's a beautiful meadow where the sparkly starfish play. Where the upsy daisies bob. But with dubbing, I can see how like the lip flaps that already exist from the Japanese dialogue would limit what the writers have to work with, and it puts more pressure on the dubbing voice actors to not only be able to catch those lip flaps, but to be able to use the dialogue they created in contrast, so that what they use as the final product. Like in Deke's case, Sailor Moon, Sailor Moon R. And with you as the center and everyone else as part of that same centerpiece. Was it intimidating to try dubbing for the first time or did the voice director make all the difference? Uh, both. <laughs> um, you seem to know a lot about the difference between original animation and dubbing, which is really cool. I think you explained it really well. Uh, Sailor Moon was my first experience dubbing. It wasn't my last. And then I also, I went to on to direct some dubbing projects after that. But yes, it, it it's very challenging. But I would argue that it's also kind of a, I don't know, a creative gift in a way. Sometimes having limitations forces you to be creative in the way that you work. So yeah. She trashed at your house too? Both Amy and Lita called me just a few minutes ago. With Major Mina warning, so I'll be prepared. Oh. You can't let her in. Just lock the doors and save yourself. But maybe she could help with Rini because she's still not sick. <coughs> Rini just screamed, so I'd better go and check on her. I'll be careful. Bye. Yes, the limitations were that you had to try to match the the vowels of the character's mouth or the consonants and you had to match the timing of it. So we had the the characters on the screen. So that's a, it's a tool, right? It gives you some indication of the emotional um, journey of the actors. You see what, what the characters look like. I should say the characters, but yes. Um, so you can see the characters. And then we had a translation uh, that was supposedly kind of synced with the, the, the mouths that we would see on screen and the translation would go underneath the image. So you could kind of be reading it. And then we'd have little cues like the beep, 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 meaning you're starting at the end of the third beep. Is that the blinking light? And the, so that helps too. There are all these cues to help, to help you. And the thing that I had experience with that was also helpful was I had been involved in musical theater and as a singer and as a dancer. So musical training was hugely helpful. I didn't realize it until I was doing it. But the rhythm and the timing and, you know, and and choreographing your voice to what you see on the screen and and being able to do it eventually kind of intuitively, like, like mm. not having to stop and think about it because you could never keep up with it if you had to do that. So I found that for me, musical training was hugely beneficial to dubbing work. And I would say that many of my co-actors would have the same response. So that's what I think I brought to the table. Um, and all of my acting training and all of the great classes that I had with wonderful teachers like Carol Rosenfeld and Uta Hagen and all of that plays into the mix so that you've done your work beforehand, your character development, you kind of know what the objectives are in that scene and that, that episode. And, and you're trying to do that work at the same time. It's a lot of things at once, kind of mm -hmm. like soap opera acting in some ways, you're thinking about a lot of different things. 
And then you asked about the director, and I would say that Roland Parliament, who directed uh, me for the time that I was there, is was a fabulous director and very collaborative. And so if I wanted to try something new, he was really open to that. He was very supportive and encouraging and positive and also very observant and helpful and could help redirect you if you needed it in ways that were productive and supportive and never ever demeaning or he never um, used his power to to get something that he wanted. It was it was truly a collaborative effort. And uh, Saul Trapani, the the main um, engineer that we worked with, was also uh, very talented. So you know the actors, Nicole Twell, the producer, uh, Roland Parliament, the voice director, and of course the stories by Naoko Takeuchi you know, were very special and meaningful, yeah. not only to us, but to many, many viewers over the last very many years. So it was a very powerful combination. I feel very honored to have been part of that team. It was a really meaningful and special experience. Listen to me, Rina, your memory. Remember the good now. Try to get up yourself. You remember how we wouldn't help you up? That's because you weren't hurt and could easily get up yourself. You also didn't listen to what we said, and as parents, we can't reward bad behavior. If we picked you up, then you would cry every time you needed something, and never learn to try for yourself. <laughs> oh no, you don't! Ugh. I'm not letting you or anybody take her! You hear me? Nobody takes her without facing me first! You're dusted, Buster! There's a, there's a lot of episodes that mm, you were the Sailor Moon mm, voice actor for that mm, are my absolute favorites. One of them was No Thanks, Nurse mm, Venus. I can dump Rini off on until I'm better? There's me! <gasps> Venus to the rescue! Oh, hi, Mina. Uh. Not only can Nurse Venus leap tall balconies in a single bound, but she can also take care of Rini and nurse your entire family back to health. Oh, uh, well, from what I hear, you taking care of Rini would be a miracle enough for us. Hop, two, three, four, come on, Serena, march yourself back to bed. But I and the other was, it was the one where you know, Sailor Mercury was accused of cheating. You shouldn't choose violence, huh? Big Toadheads deserved it, calling me Marshmallow Brain. More importantly, they called Amy a cheater when we all know it isn't true. I don't care. I know that I'm innocent. Well, you do. Hey, I'm confused. What does cheating on an exam mean? What? Some boy with humongous glasses says Amy was cheating. Huh? Now then, oh, that backstabbing bark. The, the final question I had was, in, in Sailor Moon's in case, with dubbing, I what I understand is you're alone in the booth with none of the other voice actors, and they have to wait their turns from doing the dubbing for scenes. Would you be doing multiple different scenes at once, or would you alternate in the booth from Serena says something, and then Stephanie comes in for Mina, and maybe Susan comes in for for I'll Jupiter? Sailor Venus... Sailor Jupiter scene, and then we'll we'll you know, just hold up the pictures, and you can shake the pictures, and I'm like, hey, 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 oh, I see. Okay. Improvise something quickly. All right. Okay. Um. Uh, we get it again on let's the see. Scene? Okay. Uh, Venus. <laughs> Venus. Where <laughs> is Sailor Moon? I have no idea. What are you talking about? Was she at school? She wasn't studying. I know that. I suspect the uh, there's trouble coming. Trouble. Could it be Tuxedo Mask? I hope Tuxedo Mask's not in trouble. We always have to rescue him. Or do you, do you get what I'm saying? Um, like, is it, sure, is it a scatter of, or is it bulk for each? It varies, but I would say that the the guiding factor in the scheduling is generally economic. So the producers, understandably, don't want to pay people to be there if they're not being used. So that would be the guiding factor in scheduling, mostly, unless there are conflicts and you have to, you know, figure that out with the actors. So how that usually works itself out 
is if there are a, a bunch of group scenes, let's say with all the Sailor Scouts, mm -hmm. um, the actors generally like to be in the sound booth with other actors because you kind of feed off of each other, right? That person says something this way and then you can react very organically and there's a chemistry there. Well, I should speak for myself, but my experience is most actors really prefer that. More star power! Star power! <gasps> Jupiter star power! Mercury star power! <gasps> star power! But the producers probably are not going to bring in five actors if a couple of them only have one line that day, you know? However, if there's a bunch of group scenes, say from 10 different episodes, they might bring those actors in and, and record all the group scenes in a day, for example. So as Sailor Moon, uh, I had a character who had a, an inordinate number of lines and was in almost every scene. And so often they would bring me in by myself because it didn't make a lot of economic sense to have other people there if they weren't in all the scenes. So I spent a lot of time alone in the booth, but I never felt alone because I had uh, Roland, the director, and Saul, the engineer on the other side of the glass. And it was very much a team effort with the three of us, for sure, and Nicole, the uh, producer overseeing things. So that's what I experienced most of the time with Sailor Moon. Uh, however, when I did have the opportunity to be in the booth with the other actors, I loved it. And we had so much fun. And truly... That group of actors represent some of the best voice actors in Canada. And many of them, most of them, are still working. And um, and they had all these guest roles. Like if you looked at the cast list online of all the different shows, I guarantee you, you're going to see every uh, established voice actor in Canada came through those doors at one time or the other. So that's a it's like a treasure chest of these incredible talents over so many years. So it was such a gift to work with everyone. I really, mm, uh, I really treasure that time. And yeah, I've been, I have fond memories of it and I would work with any one of them again. It was very special. We're here, Bianca. It's about time. You look, oh, you see, exquisite. In this old thing. But I designed this outfit for you just last week. That's fashion for you. One week it's hot, next week it's not. Now, show me your latest book. I'm glad that, that, mm, mm, that that's how it is because to me, the most disheartening thing mm, as an audience member would be to learn that mm, the voice actors mm, were mm, there, but they mm, didn't like mm, their mm, comrades and mm, they didn't believe in the show that they were doing. That would be the most disheartening thing. But from what I've learned, apart from few minute things and exceptions that are only human, that there isn't as much ego in voice acting as there is in other facets of media. Hmm. I, I hadn't actually thought of that before, but that's con that's an interesting theory. I mean, I suppose if you're a voice actor, you have a certain sort of anonymity, like you're using your tool, your voice to create a character yep. and that people are not seeing you. So if somebody really wants to be seen a lot, yes, then maybe another medium might be better for them. Um, I, quite, I like the challenge of um, creating characters and stories in different ways through voice acting, through writing, uh, through, through different mediums, theater, film, television, web series now I'm, I'm working in. So anyway, uh, that's a really interesting theory you have, and I'm going to have to I'm going to have to contemplate that a little bit. Like that a little I, bit. I credit that to Michael Bell because, mm, like you, he was also in a soap opera. Of course, this was way mm, in the 60s. It was the precursor to Days of Our Lives called Morning Star. He just said that, you know, mm, there's there's more mm, involved mm, mm, when, when you're on camera and you, mm, you have to look good and mm, be able to mm, have the acting chops. But... When you're behind the scenes mm, mm, as a voice actor or announcer, mm, right. mm, everyone is mm, on more equal footing because mm, the person auditioning next to you would probably mm, be considered just as good. It's just a matter of mm, having the luck mm, of mm, being able to get to the booth when you do and mm, be able to mm, show what makes you unique. 
Mm. Right. It's it's sort of like more chaos theory than mm, than a science. Mm. And I just find it all fascinating. It absolutely is. I thought a little bit longer. Thank you for that. Um, the people who I feel would judge me the least in that aspect are mm, the people that I've, mm, that I've interviewed. Mm. And that's why I find this so comforting is those who accept my invitation mm, that shows that they're willing to put their faith into me. I'm glad you feel that way. And then I, I might all, and thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And I understand how things can feel overwhelming sometimes. I certainly have been there myself many times. So I would want to ask you, do you have a support system of friends or family or professionals you can go to I do. to help hold you? I do. Mm, yeah. But, but the, mm, the thing that mm, I think mm, would make us mm, kindred in a certain way mm, is um, the mythos stories that I mentioned, the drawings that I do. Whenever I feel like I can't, you know, face the outside world mm, for mm, one reason or another for a certain amount of time, I can always go into my mm, blog site, write a bio about mm, a character that I've mm, come up with, and then I can fantasize that I'm in that world because technically I am one of the characters, a supporting character. I don't have that kind of ego. I really believe in the, the healing power of creativity, very much so. And it sounds like you have used that in your life to to ground. To ground and heal and, and take care of yourself. So good for you for discovering that. It's my Imperium Silver Crystal. Mm, very nice. Very nice. We we need more people like you and Susan Blue and so many others I've interviewed. You all give us hope in ways that we can't rely on others for. Cartoons, acting, and plays. Entertainment is one of the most important things that keeps our spirits alive. And I want to make sure that everyone who sees this or who feels it through the ethereal plane that they know that that is the lifeblood of people, even if they don't realize it. So what you and your fellow voice actors for Deke and everyone else have done, it doesn't go unpunished positively in the universe. You know, it took me a lot of years to come to that realization, which I, I now share with you, which is that telling stories through entertainment and through all these mediums can really make a difference in the world. So thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure, Jeffrey. You you are a wealth of information and uh, I appreciate your research and, and your heart. I appreciate your heart. Coming from you, Terry, that means everything. <laughs>